So this morning's first panel is on securing giant leaps in space exploration. You heard from the last speaker that Purdue University is the number one non-military organization for producing astronauts. So I think it's very fitting that we're, we're exploring this today. Uh, I even wore my space tie today, if you notice. It's, uh, it, it's keeping with the theme, so we're going well. We've got another, I think, outstanding panel today set up for us. The, the moderator is known to anybody that's worked in, in this field before, uh, Professor Dan De Laurentiis. He's the director for the Institute of Global Security and Defense Innovation and a professor of aeronautics and astronautics here at Purdue University. Uh, he's got a long list of accomplishments uh, behind him, and uh, I know that he's been sort of the go-to guy in, uh, in everything Astro Aero here on this campus. So rather than dwelling on that, I'm just going to go straight to the panel. I'll, I'll let Dan introduce his uh, colleagues on the panel, and we'll take it from there. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jerry. How's my microphone working? Good? All right. Well, uh, welcome, everyone. And uh, it, it is a great opportunity uh, for me to be chairing this panel. Uh, what I've found in my faculty career over the years is that I've gotten better and better at asking questions rather than answering them sometimes. And so I have the pleasure of uh, putting a, a little context out there for the panel and then asking some questions of our panelists to get things going but certainly want to get vigorous participation from, from all of you in the audience. So uh, speaking of Cradle of Astronauts, you know, my childhood dream was to be an astronaut. Um, I was, besides being so fascinated by space, I know my colleague here and I share a lot of, of this background, uh, besides being fascinated by space uh, from really as early as I can remember, it was one of the only careers in which my height was optimized for that occupation. Uh, so uh, that was good. And so actually, I uh, just as, just a little background and context here. I, I um, went to the Florida Institute of Technology. I want to give a shout out to FIT in, in Melbourne, Florida, for my undergraduate program, because I was convinced that the only way I could become an astronaut was to go to the university that was closest to the Kennedy Space Center. So that showed you sometimes my narrow thinking, not realizing that. For a Chicago kid, down the road here in West Lafayette, Indiana, was this wonderful place called Purdue. Um, but um, uh, life and serendipity uh, did bring me back here. And it's been a fabulous journey uh, for me here in Purdue Aero Astro Department. Um, the wonderful heritage, but also, I think, the wonderful uh, forward-looking uh, aspects that we have for um, space exploration and everything about space. Obviously, you all know from the format of the panels here at the symposium that uh, we're celebrating our 150th anniversary here at Purdue. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary of Apollo and probably X number of other anniversaries that I'm uh, missing. But certainly, uh, the heritage in, in space exploration at Purdue, beyond not just our aero astro department, some of those wonderful astronauts that we've had and some of the innovators that we've generated from Purdue come from varied departments. Um, and so that's another testament, I think, to Purdue's role in this space. But um, we also, I think, because of this great history, we have always to make sure that we're not focusing too much on our history, but we're also focusing on the future. And so anniversaries are those kind of double-edged swords, if you will, or opportunities is a better word, for us to also look ahead. And so thinking about 50 years in the future, uh, while the title of this panel is on space exploration, I think it's fair to say that all the evidence shows that the next 50 years is likely to be what really people thought we were going to get to 50 years ago after the great Apollo successes, and that is not just sending astronauts uh, into various places in, in uh, cislunar space, but actually as a society, as humanity, becoming a species that lives and works outside uh, off of the Earth. So that's the lens I would like to use for thinking about um, this panel and for the discussion we're going to have, ranging from commerce in space, commerce on Earth that's generated from space, using resources in space to enhance life on Earth, and then again, ultimately, finding a way for us to have a regular presence for uh, humanity uh, off of this planet. And when you think about it with that lens, at least the way I think about it, and when I think about that lens, 
we have to do all the things uh, that we do with every other aspect of our civilization here on Earth. And that is have robust infrastructure, have economic and policy constructs that make things work, or at least work as well as possible. Um, and part of that, of course, is making sure things are secured uh, in a manner that's appropriate while also being flexible to responding to new opportunities, new demand signals from the market, and all of those things that we care about to have a vibrant societal uh, uh, asset uh, in terms of a new place to do things that we love to do as humans. So that's the very broad lens that I'd like us to think about in terms of uh, space exploration. And I think we have a panel here that comes from, uh, uh, each of them come from a distinctly, I would say, different background, which is exactly the point of why we formed this panel. And so what I'd like to do is, is briefly uh, introduce them. And really, you have, I think, bios uh, in the packet, but I want to just say a few words about them. And then I'm going to follow that with an initial prompting question that uh, will be broad enough to ge uh, generate, I think, a lot of reaction from the panel. And then um, we'll move on from there and certainly hope to get the audience participation as well. So uh, sitting on my left is Professor Barrett Caldwell, Professor of Industrial Engineering. Uh, and again, one of my closest colleagues here ever since I, I joined Purdue. Um, and we've worked on several projects together, Barrett, uh, uh, as you know, in, in the space exploration area. And, and so again, I think you can see from Barrett's background um, he, he brings a, a really amazing perspective, in my humble opinion, in terms of the human factors part of these new uh, activities that we're going to do in this big vision for space, but also, I think, a critical look on how information uh, sharing and information processing plays a role in that. And so uh, I think what you'll find from Barrett is very much of a stimulating set of ideas that are going to cause us to think sometimes less about the physical things that we'll be doing stuff in space, but uh, in many ways the interactions between them. At least that's my hope. Uh, Dalin Chu is a Deputy for Technology Programs at Sandia National Labs. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet Dalin very recently uh, in person at Sandia, and, and I just know from that short interaction that he has sort of a deep background uh, in, in areas that relate uh, to national security in, in terms of the assets that we have in space, especially some of the electronic uh, and related components of any of the systems that we're going to be using in fielding. Uh, but I think his research background and his research leadership at Sandia really uh, is going to be a great value add to the conversation here because of some of the uh, issues that he knows are out there, but some of the mitigations that are uh, on the horizon as well. Uh, next, I believe, is Carolyn Firm, our, my colleague in Aero Astro. Um, she's an assistant professor uh, and uh, in our department and focusing on, on many different sort of technology areas in and around uh, space situational awareness and our ability to fuse information. Um, to, to protect assets and to understand where assets are, et cetera. So again, think about space traffic management, just like air traffic management will be a critical infrastructure and a critical activity that we're going to have to accomplish. Um, among many other reasons, I'm wonderfully happy to have Carolyn as a colleague just before this. Uh, I saw her in the back of the room and I said, Carolyn, are you ready to be smart and quippy? And she said, aren't I always? <laughs> so my point was proved. Uh, so Carolyn, welcome. And finally, Cliff Macklin, who uh, uh, I'm very excited about uh, having on our panel because among the, all of our panelists, Cliff is someone I haven't met yet, so I'm looking forward to a wonderful uh, set of new ideas from a colleague that uh, I think is going to be able to share a lot for us. As you can see from the bio, Cliff is an engineering fellow at Raytheon. As any of you know from these large uh, companies that have thousands and thousands of employees, becoming an engineering fellow means that you are one of the, the very select few within the company that have produced a distinguished record. Uh, and really, uh, beyond the record, it's, it's, it's a person that the company relies on for new ideas and charting a course in the future. So I'm sure Cliff will be sharing some of those ideas with us. So with that introduction uh, of the panel, Here's the first question I would like to put on the table. And that is, in short, 
in this wonderful world that we, are, we will be entering in for many activities in space. What could go wrong? <laughs> Let's start with the depressing part, uh, and then we'll come back around to uh, what are some great ideas for making it right. Professor Caldwell. Thanks for starting with that softball. <laughs> So when we were talking during the break, uh, Professor Dick, they were, I'm just going to quote. Uh, said, can you come up with three words? And I thought, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And, and then, because I knew that I was going to be backed up, I, I'm not going to talk about shooting at things. I'm not going to talk about sticking flash drives in the computers or any of that stuff. My three words are unresolved stack over. We just had a, a, a GPS time clock rollover that not everybody got the memo, literally. And so there are people who are not appropriately reading their GPS signals. That's a bad day. Uh, I mean, we go back 50 years, and we've got our, our, our man, Neil, flying around, trying to land, and we've got alarms. They're data alarms. Fortunately, it's a really good pilot flying a really robust machine with a few extra gallons in the tank. And so that stack overflow got managed. What happens if we've got a sysloaner uh, program where people are not in continuous comms? Worse yet, if we are two thirds of the way to Mars or 62 sols into a Mars exploration, you have a space forward architecture so that most of the problem resolution gets solved by the crew and by the onboard intelligent agents. If they have a stack overflow, they have to start thinking about which data do I support and ground won't help me. That's a very bad. Yeah, so uh, I would say, again, you try and foresee the unforeseen, but again, in a billion dollar payload, okay, satellite payload, you're dealing with latent hardware component failures that are just, despite your best efforts for qualification and uh, screening, you're dealing with a very harsh environment. So some of these are um, uh, you know, detectable and um, through qualification, but many times actually you're dealing with just small quantities of components, right? And we all know how Intel and the semiconductor business works is it's massive volumes. But when you're dealing with very small quantities, you're dealing with components that could po possibly fail and, and they have failed. So certainly that's a major concern, okay? And your uh, customers don't like hearing, you know, something's not working and, and again, at Sandia we try and figure out ways to fix that. Um, Likewise, I would say flight software. Again, despite your best efforts to make sure that your flight software, you've exercised various different scenarios. Again, things happen, right? It, to the extent that you gets locked in a particular uh, mode where you no longer can point your telescope at a particular area of interest to the extent that, again, um, you do your best to do ample testing. But things go, Murphy's Law, things go wrong. So I thought when, when I first heard uh, Dan asking the question, I thought one thing we have to realize that space is a different domain than what we are used on, on Earth. For one, autonomy is not a choice, okay? So um, we are relying on highly autonomous uh, systems sometimes in the, in, the, uh, in the percentage. We have onboard astronauts and they can do a few things, but they are extremely limited. Um, so we, we are relying on an autonomous system. And in order to, to run that, we have to communicate with it, okay? It's not, it's not a choice. My mission is not gonna be successful if I just send it up and never communicate with it. That's our definition of space debris at that point. So we have to keep a communication channel open and that automatically makes the system vulnerable, okay, as we know. So 
as we are so so far away from these things, scenarios as, for example, software updates are very different. It was maybe the first time we had a similar scenario on Earth when we were talking about the Nike shoe failure, right? The self-tying shoes. There was a software update to start them, and that destroyed your, I don't know, $300 sneaker. And that was a big shock for people here, but that is kind of the dimension of economic failure that you have. This is not an unknown failure in, in space, that you change the software, you have to update something, and then there's no way of recovering it. And that, that then leads to, to physical uh, failure of your system, to the death of your, of your satellite, similar to the Nike shoes. That is not a, as rare scenario as we have it here on Earth, but a more common scenario. The other thing we have to keep in mind is what we already heard, kind of the physical environment. It also means we are operating boxes or kind of computer towers flying around with several kilometers per second. Okay, so we have kind of bullet speed. That means if something goes wrong, something breaks off, it's going to damage us. If we maneuver into something else, it's going to damage us. If we want to land on Mars and we have the velocity wrong, we're just going to crash into the surface. So in that thing, since failures are, uh, have mu much higher repercussions than we are used to, and economic failure has a much higher impact than what we used to, where we can still kind of plug in the USB cable and try to save it if an up update goes wrong. All right, so what could go wrong? So as an engineer, um, I've been working on systems for a long time, developing new systems and, and things like that. And my saying is always usually, you know, nothing works unless you make it work. Everything comes broken, right? Nothing just, just starts to work, right? So um, if you say nothing, what, what can go wrong? The first question I would ask is similar to what the, what the, uh, he was discussing earlier with the green and red slide. It seems like everyone paid attention to that slide. So those first two steps being super critical. So my background, again, is embed systems a lot and, and cybersecurity in terms of uh, getting cybersecurity and weapon systems and things like that. The first step is understanding what, is, what are you expecting to get right? Um, and I think that's, a, just to reiterate what was talked about earlier, is that's a, the critical step, is to understand if you're, what, are you, what kind of uh, risk are you willing to, willing to take? Um, on, this, on a lot of the contract that work that I do, you'd like to believe that cybersecurity on, on some of our systems is going to be like you're going to spend uh, you know, billions of dollars. It is the government after all, so they must spend, they'll, they'll just be willing to spend billions of dollars on everything. And that's not the case, right? These contracts are very um, cost and schedule sensitive. And cybersecurity very often is a, at this point, is a unwelcome guest very often, right? When you're trying to uh, put a radar in the a radar in a plane, the idea is that it finds targets and it helps you maneuver and so on and so forth. The idea isn't that I have a function on there that detects an intruder, and and that's not the the really the focus of what that product is for. So again, it comes down to when I look at that, in, even in space, whatever those systems might be, what are the what is the what is your risk appetite, and what are you trying to accomplish? You know, some of the things when you look at space from a cybersecurity cyber perspective and you start talking about, um, I mean, putting people on another planet and things like that and interacting, you know, one of the things that we take advantage of, obviously, in, in everyday life and that we're used to is the paradigm of being able to authenticate when I can reach out and touch that person, right? You know, that, that physicality is a, is a huge way of how we make sure things are real, right? Everybody's heard of the red, red, red pill, blue pill. Well, if you have a whole society somewhere else and all your connection is through this network um, of, of, of technology and so on, um, the possibilities of what could go wrong are, seem to be almost endless when you start talking about the motivations relative to financial, never mind uh, the loss of life and, and what's going on. You talk about with the elections and the undercutting confidence. You can imagine the impacts of attacking a system like that when you talk about the magnitude of investment as well as the, the national pride and all the other things that are wrapped around that. So. Um, I would, if we're talking about what can go wrong, I'd, have, I'd really say, okay, what are we looking, what are we expecting to get first, right? So actually, I, I'd like to build on that, Cliff, and it really has been kind of a, a natural flow here. Um, so speaking of sort of 
understanding you know, what could go wrong and what's expected to go right, um, I'm, I'm thinking back first to the Apollo program. How many of you have seen this interesting, really fascinating feature out right now uh, called Apollo 11? It's in the movie theaters. Anyone? Anyone? Okay. No, it's not many. I, I strongly recommend it. Uh, I took my six-year-old son to it, and, and I think we were both equally fascinated. And popcorn helped one of us stay focused uh, on that. But it is not. I, I wanted to find the right word. Have you seen it? Okay. It's it's not a dramatization. It's not a Hollywood flick. It's a basically an hour and a half long compilation of real footage from the mission, uh, you know, from the from the, the capsule and what the astronauts were doing and prior to launch, how they were getting ready. Their only really sort of voiceover is Walter Cronkite, but that's ac his actual voiceover from the, from the time things were being prepared for the launch of the mission. So really fascinating, and just time after time, every critical function, every critical part was actually going as expected. Now, we know later Apollo programs had something different, but the, even though they were going into a relatively unknown environment, of course, we, we were at the moon before Apollo 11, right? We just didn't land on it. There was a very well-defined, I think, and a lot of engineers and a lot of people contributed to that. One of the reasons, actually, as an aside, we're so proud of Neil Armstrong as a Purdue alum is that, as you saw from when he returned from the mission and the rest of his life, he always deflected the praise to the people, not only his fellow crewmates, but the people on the ground, the thousands of people uh, in Houston and everywhere else in the, in the corporate uh, community that contributed. Anyway, so everything went well. So take that and building on Cliff's comment about how do we deal with these unimagined possibilities. So now let me imagine 30 years from now, we have a, a permanent commercial presence on the moon. I want you all to visualize this because you're on the, going to have to react to it here shortly. We have multiple uh, corporations and, and some government operations taking place on the moon. There's a mining operation that's the core of this vibrant commercial uh, activity. And uh, there's a, a vibrant set of hotels in cislunar space that are transiting people. There's tourists, there's workers coming to the surface. Uh, lots, billions and billions of dollars are being made and, and prosperous uh, things are happening. And then all of a sudden, on a sunny side of the moon, Monday morning, they discover a strange black object <laughs> with the dimensions of <laughs> one by four by nine. I expected more laughter. Uh, <laughs> I get it. Said, okay. Yeah. Okay, so. And, and shortly after that, it really didn't get reported anywhere, but shortly after that, all of the critical communications between the, the, that presence on the moon and the, and the Earth, the, all, all the, any of the operations and even the economic uh, transaction stuff, all go haywire. And there are multiple countries operating also on the lunar surface at this time. And so how would you, Barrett, Go about figuring out what went wrong. You owe me a beer after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think. Oh. Ow. Okay. So one one of the first issues that that I, I would say is that everyone on this uh, lunar enterprise zone, if you will, had been issued as part of their uh, standard deployment pack a copy of Heinlein's The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. <laughs> and one of the reasons is that, actually, it's not that far off from one of the scenarios that, that's being played out in Heinlein's book. Um, and this is obviously a few years before uh, Kubrick took his shot. Uh, the people who are up there will start out with representation and alignment with the corporation or the nation that they started with. They will evolve fairly quickly into a different orientation to being whatever phrase they use, lunatic comes to mind, uh, to say, we're in this together and no one down there is going to help us as much as us up here, even if you're from a competing country. <laughs> 
even if you're from a competing corporation, especially if you then tell us that we are not going to get any more uh, edicts or insights or recommendations from uh, the home office as long as this obelisk is here. They are going to have to figure out how they're going to work together, how they're going to do local comm, local interactions, I don't know, putting together uh, regolith uh, for little standing stone uh, signals. Uh, but they're going to have to work together, and they're going to have to have that sense of a local culture that transcends wherever they came from, specifically to deal with these sorts of interruptions. I like it. You still owe me. Adaptive culture. Um, well, I guess again, with a kind of more of a nefarious mind, you know, one would want to make sure that all communications of all countries are knocked out, and it wasn't maybe a suspicious implant by an adversary. So again, um, you know, you're dealing certainly with um, any number of possibilities. You know, it could have been an EMP event that could have knocked out all the electronics. So uh, again, provided, let's say, you get the benefit of the doubt that it was something of an alien nature. Certainly there would be an alliance formed and we certainly would want to interrogate it and make sure that if it's giving off certain emissions that disabled all the you know, capabilities of, um, abroad. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would agree. We would take a unified front to uh, certainly understand and figure out what can be done and maybe perhaps communicate with it to the extent of um, maybe scenes out of you know, the movies. Any thoughts from the latter end of the table? Yeah, I mean, you, you put out these scenarios, and now, now I have to kind of uh, play the spoiler sport here, but <laughs> I mean, so for one, I think we do not have to, to kid ourselves. Even in that scenario, you're not self-sufficient on the moon at, at that point. So you're, you're looking, if communication and um, transportation of goods cannot be established in that scenario, we're looking at death of the community on the, on the moon. Um, I would go briefly into kind of a philosophical uh, viewpoint here. I would say no alliance is, is formed, but more with, uh, with Thomas Hobbes, that life is brutish and short, and that kind of the strongest ones will survive. I think um, there will be a very nasty time on the moon where um, weaker parts are suppressed and um, Hunger some, Games. Yeah, it's got some kind of more tech-savvy, small alliance of, of a handful of people will um, kind of rule and, and then um, trying to, to solve it on, on the technical level and um, maybe then the most or the best equipped ones from their home country will take out the other ones because they're, they're just uh, useless eaters at this point. Um, so, so I have a bit more um, kind of uh, negative view on on that. Um, when we want to tie it to um, kind of nowadays, um, we're, we are looking into making further moon missions uh, as it looks at the moment. And maybe it's worthwhile to make a comparison um, to kind of the Apollo missions. I mean, from the computational standpoint, I mean, we have even on, on the old phones, which were not smartphones, we had kind of similar compu computation power than what we put on the, on the Apollo mission, okay? So that means the computation that, that we did and the, and the software that we employed were very different, okay? And that was also the, um, the, the, the time where we still did com computing on the cards and, and these things that some of you remember, okay? When we're doing missions now, it will be very different and I think it will also make us more vulnerable. We can do more things, we can do that much better in a sense, but we also see we make new mistakes. If we are looking at the, the, the Boeing Max at the moment, I mean, that was a, a way of giving more autonomy to the system. And we can do that because we have better computational power, but then we are leading also into new failures that the Apollo mission could not have in that sense because the computation were on such a lower level at that point. We're also going to do that not with one big spaceship, but most likely we will do that 
with kind of a swarm of smaller satellites, kind of one uh, bigger part carrying the astronauts and then swarming satellites which are supporting. That's a much better way of doing it. If it works properly, it's more robust. However, it also makes it a lot more vulnerable. Okay? Any communication, I mean, I have wireless communication between the parts of the satellites. That means that there's also communication I can kind of tap into. Uh, a small satellite has very limited capabilities. Okay? It makes it also harder to put on more security. Okay? On the other hand, I have a, a cube in space. Maybe it can maneuver a little bit. It has a large velocity, so I can still use it kind of as a physical impactor if I want to just do damage to it. So I think thinking about the old Apollo days is, is good, but we're in a much different place nowadays. So what, he said, uh, this thing shows up, there's no communication, and what do I do now, right? So this is the kind of conversation that, um, that you would have before you've actually put people on the moon, hopefully, <laughs> right? So this would be the, this would be the state of trying to figure out what, uh, what you need to, to go right, right? So if, if we were having, hopefully, this conversation, if it just happened once you were already up there, I will send everyone else first, right? If this is the, if this is the approach. But um, if, uh, if you've had this conversation already, it's, it really comes down, it's, it's really similar to what I consider, you know, just regular architecture when you're dealing with CPUs and things like that. Um, you lose communication, but in and of itself, that's information for people on Earth. So you have an idea of you, a, a protocol between, I would expect that you, having had this conversation, a priori, right? That you'd have a, you'd have the idea of a protocol, right? You'd have to you'd have to know if you're not going to be self-sufficient with a pr certain particular population. You limit the population size based on what the resources are. You'd have a, a projection of how many days you can actually survive, and your protocol would have 15 layers of redundancy. In other words, I'm sending things up there or physically making that connection within a within a quarter of that time if something goes wrong, right? So. Um, I think it really, you know, if, if your, your original question was how do you debug the kind of what's, why'd you lose communication? Um, probably in that kind of disaster recovery situation, there's probably another protocol of survival first and then figuring out later just reestablishing communication regardless if I have a bunch of junk flying in the air that I was supposed to be using to communicate, reestablishing that communication, right? So um, I think this, this is the, it's, it's, it's the, it's the perfect question to ask beforehand and it's often when I work with customers sometimes and they come in because cybersecurity is ob obviously something that um, people can't easily measure often um, it really comes down to what you expect to happen correctly and the risk that you're willing to take um, it's it, it's exact exactly that question that I'll have with them about well this is your architecture and this is your this is how you think the system's going to run and they haven't asked questions like that a priori sometimes and you go and they tell you how it's going to work you say well then you're okay with this happening well no of course not I'm not okay with that happening if, the, if all the communication comes out and everybody dies in a week I'm not happy with that well that's what your architecture has right now built into it I mean it's just you're not trying to architect for this specific scenario um, so it is a good place to start even from a when you're looking at cybersecurity and you're trying to help somebody with their system and you ask them what people don't know about least privilege access you know protecting access and all these defense in depth and all these are basically a different language to a lot of people who don't deal with cybersecurity but that kind of question right there when you go they know what they want to protect though they know what bad behavior looks like and if you if you pose it that way very often okay you have this information and it, it may go away for three days because of X, Y, Z, or you, you may lose this capability completely when this goes out. You're okay with that. That's all right. And then that conversation starts talking about building that protocol and building the systems and responses at the, at the detail level and at the CPU ASIC level in terms of what, you, what you're doing from a system standpoint, all the way up to the strategy for the overall system, right? Um, so hopefully there's a plan before you get there. So... As I'm listening, I, I do want to add one more piece, and, and Caroline, I, I actually now understand how dark dark can be, and I'll, so, so I'll, I'll ask you again the next time I, I need that. Um, but, wow. but no, but no, the, there's a really serious issue here about what do we do, and do we try to solve the problem, do we try to detect and isolate and recover the problem according to our standard mechanisms, or do a bunch of people go out and kick dirt until it says, okay, land food here in the dust. 
and you can still have a telescope that sees that. And so when we think about what is our response, our response should be to set up robust alternatives, not just to dig down into whatever we had before. Well, I have one quick follow-up, but I'd like the audience to be prepared if they're not prepared already. Um, because after that, a few quick comments on that, I would like uh, those of you in the audience that have some questions to take this conversation forward to come up to the microphone. So briefly, picking up, I think, you know, we, we kind of documented uh, there's a lot that could go wrong. I think the word infinite was used, uh, and that's probably the case. But then Cliff and then and Barrett just started talking about what are we going to do about it, you know, <laughs> be prepared, look at your architecture. And I think what you were trying to say is also there's the robustness to the scenarios you haven't thought of, right, Barrett? Anything else the panel wants to share? I'd like to add one more point on, on, on what to do about it, and that is, I think this future in space will be one in which no single entity owns all the assets. And so a strict sort of command and control uh, and operations model you know, is, is probably not going to be present. So with that lens, any thoughts on what we can do better in terms of mitigations and, and adaptations? Dalin or Carolyn, if you'd like to start since Cliff and um, so, so I think if, if the as we are going to the, um, to the smaller architectures with a, with a number of, of CubeSats or small sats, I mean, one thing is to be prepared and then say, okay, what happens if one, two, three, four, five of those die on me? Mm -hmm. And then, okay, can I have a reconfigurable network on that? Can it do that autonomously without kind of uh, risky software update that I have to do from the ground that could potentially go wrong soon? So that we are more configurable, then um, refurbishing in space is becoming an issue. It's kind of um, hard on the, on the physical side, but um, kind of on the, on the software side, it's okay, can you, if something dies on it, can you reuse it in, in the best possible way? And um, I think it's, yeah, the planning ahead and having the flexibility mm -hmm. in mind that, that we need, because things will go wrong. Yeah, and, and I would, you know, further add, I mean, you build in a lot of redundancy you're dealing, you're, you're dealing also with a uh, harsh radiation environment. So, uh, you know, redundancy helps, uh, but uh, probably you would also be interested in, you know, collecting data analytics. What are the symptoms of the other, uh, you know, counterpart systems to arrive at, whether it might be specific to, you know, the nature of the architecture or some other parameter with respect to doing diagnostics? And again, you know, if the failure modes are all common, then you've got a serious problem, you know, maybe of alien nature, so. Well, all right, why don't we uh, have some audience participation? Uh, so anyone want to start off some of the reactions or questions? They could be, of a, I'm sure the panelists would field anything from technology questions to philosophy questions to science fiction, fiction questions. <laughs> uh, please use, uh, go ahead. Are we passing microphones here? There's one in the middle. Okay. Okay. Okay, thanks for a very interesting uh, discussion of, of, of this space domain. So uh, the problems that you are de uh, defining are fairly generic, uh, you know, highly robust. Um, it has to be robust. It has to be, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, highly autonomous, rec reconfigurable. But uh, these, these are generic problems. So are they, what would be a research agenda? Let's say I want to start a new program, research program. What, can you articulate a few fundamental problems that are specific to space uh, in this area? I'll, I'll, I can start. Yeah, thanks. We don't know how to launch mission control. Right now, every sea cert, every uh, response team, every group we have is very human heavy. We don't know how to create intelligent agents 
that are effective teammates with a small number of humans. That we can split out some of the function allocation, but we are not uh, having a fight over control. So one of the questions is, if I've got, and actually I'm thinking about this right now for some projects. How in the world am I going to get agents that know how to communicate with the crew in uh, re reducing a whole bunch of data and turning it into effective teammate information? And it's really hard to go. It's really hard to stay on Mars if we don't have that capability because you cannot rely on the ground to save you at 12 light minutes one way. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So when you say, you know, what's this, what are some research areas? I mean, uh, we've talked about some kind of generic problems too, right? So one of the things I would be asking first, you know, is what is the specific problem that you're trying to deal with, right? So if we specifically talk about the communications issue, right, um, uh, in terms of the availability of, of communications, and then there's the other aspect that he brought up about that um, being working for the aerospace and defense, the idea of sharing, um, sharing isn't as, 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 as uh, comfortable for me um, as far as uh, infrastructure and things like that in space. Um, so if you, if you tackle, for example, the sharing of infrastructure in space, how do you, uh, given a particular functionality that you support, assuming it's not um, uh, national security related uh, as far as you know, detecting missiles and these kind of things, intelligence and those kind of things, um, how do you share infrastructure in a trustworthy manner? And what are the aspects of of how you'd go about doing that. I think there's some very positive things about it because obviously, as far as this example that we flew out from a communication standpoint, there's a, and I think someone else had mentioned, there's a vested interest in everybody making sure it still works. But there's also the aspect of being an, it being available to everybody as well. And you've got code from possibly multiple different places that are at different levels of trust and things like that. So how do you, how do you create a, an infrastructure that is shared but at the same time trusted to provide the service that you're expecting out of it, I think is a, would, be a, would be a bit of a challenge. And this is specific to space? This arises, this problem? Well, I'm saying specifically, the reason why I think space is, uh, is, a, is a big deal is, like I said, I think um, you know, one, of the, one of the things that you do in networks a lot, right, is, is for authenticity, um, you, uh, well, there's, there's two aspects of this for, for this particular thing. I, I do not deal with systems. I've never, I don't, we don't see a lot of systems that are mission critical, like this is mission critical in some fashion, right? That um, um, as far as the defense and aerospace where we, we share, even if we do share, there's other ways if that doesn't work, right? Generally, right? So if you were gonna actually be in a situation where you're sharing and it's mission critical, there's, there's a high level of, of, uh, of trust that's gonna be required and that's hard to achieve in a situation where you don't control all the aspects of that individual, that piece, right? So that's a, how that works, how you make that work exactly, I think would be a pretty hard problem, right? So, and, and space, I think, adds some new, um, new challenges to that. Um, you know, one of the things is, you know, having out of band, like certificate authorities and things like that to do authentication, all these kind of things. You know, it's easy to say, well, I got to fall back of physical, the physical aspect of getting things to where I need them to be. But um, because everything is not, you don't have that physical aspect, and you've got this other party sitting on your on your machine that can now um, subvert maybe the functionality and things like that. It's a it's a different problem, right? So, for example, if you think think of like Spectre and Meltdown, right? Spectre and Meltdown are issues because people can um, running code on the system can do things to the system to take advantage of the shared resources on that particular system, and not the system itself, but the processor itself, right? Um, in this type of environment, you could very easily see having code of multiple people, and now that, that, that particular vulnerability becomes more relevant than if only my code can run on that system, right? So these are the kind of things that you, um, there's a lot of problems, I think, to solve with shared infrastructure, especially if it's mission critical. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I was just going to add also, I think, to do it in a cost-effective and insertion ease standpoint, I mean, right, costs and time in terms of, uh, uh, you know, designers wanting to incorporate that because I mean the whole thing about trusted systems is there's an insertion cost right and the bottom line is is that you've got schedule and these 
billion dollar programs that uh, again exceedingly just uh, have uh, extreme pressures. So, so again, you know, we look at our commercial counterparts, right, SpaceX and so forth, how they've been able to expediently um, deploy their their uh, systems. So, I, so I think there's there's a lot that you know government can learn, probably from how the commercial side is. Uh, getting more in the business. Uh, on the other hand, I think there's a lot of government regulations imposed on safety, and I'm not saying that commercial entities don't have to do that. I'm just saying they don't have as much of the red tape and bureaucracy. And uh, I think, again, elements of automation in terms of flight mission planning, because, again, these take months to years versus incorporating more autonomy to uh, have things that could be done in a quicker time frame, because, again, it boils down to cost and money. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I would just add, add on to it. Yeah, I mean, eliminating the, the human in the loop, um, thinking about inter-satellite communication. We, just, we cannot just have a, have a Wi-Fi and communicate over that. So that's space-specific. What are ways of communication that, that work under those extreme constraints of computational power? You have a very small processor. Um, for the navigation solution, you have uh, four milliseconds do that to figure out where you are, where you're looking. So, so those, those are specific constraints, uh, small batteries, well, what communication works, um, how can we have higher um, autonomy on that, uh, as was mentioned before. Another space-specific problem that also relates to the moon is um, how can we have external information on it if we are losing communication? How can we have telescope, radar, or other systems that allow to passively kind of figure out things about the satellite so that we know, okay, in which direction is the antenna pointing so if that we can reestablish communication as we are so far away that's different from other systems that we know. Okay, thanks a lot. I'd just like to say, wonderful presentation. I love the, uh, uh, the 2001 references. That's excellent. <laughs> Enjoyable, but terrifying. Um, Mr. Macklin, I talking about in regards to uh, cybersecurity applications on, say, a theoretical human mission to Mars, you know, back and forth. You're not so worried about someone sniffing your ports, you know, breaking in, stealing your stuff. You're four minutes from Earth. It's, it's not going to happen. But how would you go about designing a system architecture that's designed less to protect from outside influences and more to protect the system from itself while working, while presenting a a way for highly trained lay people who aren't necessarily cybersecurity experts to correct system errors when it goes about. Basically, a, a self-correcting, uh, you know, different tools for self-correcting problems within the system so a catastrophic meltdown doesn't happen and everybody dies. Right. So, uh, yeah, so as far as, I mean, there's a lot of issues. I mean, I understand the idea of uh, you saying for sniffing ports and things like that for entry, right? But um, so you're worried about integrity is huge, right? Um, for what you're for what you're worried about there. Um, so how do you keep it up and running and not have a cybersecurity expert sitting on board analyzing everything as you go? I think is kind of what you're saying. Just reiterating. Okay, okay. So um, I th I think from an uh, from a, from an from an architectural standpoint, you know, you're talking about trying to build in a kind of aided resilience kind of thing, right? So it's not like it's completely autonomously going to continue to run on its own and monitor everything and, and be able to self-heal and, uh, and, and move forward, um, you're saying, just with, with some help. So I think the keys in that kind of environment is, first of all, uh, from an architectural standpoint, um, you, you want to be able to create some slop, is what I would call it, um, relative to your ability to, to fix things. So you're definitely going to have to deal with some level of redundancy and things like that anyway. Um, the, 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 the challenge with redundancy, right, is that if uh, people tend to use it, right, and you fail over, but the problem is then what happens when you fail again and then you, you can't fail back over, right? So reconstitution and things like that are important, right? So. Right, right. At some point, you're running out, right? And um, there are, like, say, size, weight, and power concerns and things like that. You can't make this thing uh, a bus, right? So in terms of the amount of stuff that you drop on it. So obviously, you need, what you need is 
Um, you could say you have tools and things like that. My approach probably wouldn't be this, but um, I'll tell you what I would probably think you'd want to do. But it, it, you could probably have like things like uh, tools and things like that to do analysis that obviously would have to take this information and make it actionable to, to, uh, to do reconstitution. I think if you have laymen and things like that, you're probably going to break things more than you're going to fix things. And you don't need people trying to think too deeply when they're in those environments. So in, in most cases, it, or as, as little as possible, right? There's enough to worry about as it is. Um, so I, I would probably take the approach as some level of redundancy, probably more than one, depending on where you got for, for uh, size, weight, power, and, and your requirements and so on. And then reconstitution would be a um, start over type of approach. And the, tool that, the tools that I would probably uh, say you'd want are the kind of tools that kind of rebuild you from a known state um, versus trying to analyze and figure out and things like that. If you assume that the environment is one where you're not actively being attacked because you say, well, you're too far away and things like that, um, if, that's the, if that's the threat model you're working with, um, you know, one of the challenges might be that if you're running into things that if you don't have an inherent problem in what you've developed, then you might have a supply chain problem, which could be, which could be something you can't really subvert. After, at that point, you might just be in bad shape. You're just trying to keep it limping along until you get somewhere. But. Again, thank you all for, for presenting today. It's very interesting. You know, thousands of years ago, I worked on SETI, uh, and what we were worried about was being spoofed on Earth, you know, like you know, crop dusting, I mean, not crop dusting, circles in the fields, and the, the, equi the electronic equivalent of that is somebody spoofing us and making us think we were getting readings that weren't really coming from out there. Uh, but having said that, I, I would urge you also to think about, I haven't heard people talk about software, and. Uh, I don't, I don't see any breathtaking breakthroughs in software yet these days, and you know, formal methods will kill you if you try to do it for something, unless it's the absolute smallest, most critical code you have. And so I, I would urge you also to think about folks from the reliability world and what they're saying in this, in this venue as well. Uh, and and it, the other idea is about supporting autonomy of the individuals in space. It's a lot similar to medicine and supporting a physician uh, with information about how to make you know, they typically have just a set of symptoms, but they need a lot more support for more complex decisions. Uh, and so I, I really think the idea of supporting the autonomy of those individuals there with AI and other kinds of things is really crucial. But, uh, my main point was about the software. I'm, you know, NASA's done tremendous work in the area, in this area, but it's still a, a tremendous amount of code that's unverifiable, un, unknown. And you really have a uh, black swan issue and all that n rat's nest of software that's been written decades ago and is still functioning out there. So. Great question. Sal, do you have any thoughts to start with? Or? Well, um, uh, like it's well, I, mission, I, you know, in terms of yeah. Uh, I mean, and again, I, I think your point about legacy code is is a good one. I mean, it's very expensive to, you know, um, f for that matter more expensive to revamp the code than frequently the hardware. So typically it's not touched. And, and again, it kind of boils down to budgetary constraints as far as, again, in the ideal world, if you had infinite resources, um, you would try and address all the possible scenarios. But, but again, even for folks that we work with, I mean, they always say, well, we'd like to kind of know what your ROI is in terms of, again, if you're dealing with a trusted system, what should we look at? across the board on our system that gives us the best, um, you know, uh, reassurance or resiliency given the insertion costs. And because, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, there's a number of different um, circumstances where, including the trusted foundry, right, I mean, where there was a mandate that all government uh, defense electronics go through that. And, and it was, yeah, exactly. It's, it's exuberant in terms of the, uh, the ability for folks to adopt that because ASICs are very expensive. FPGAs are essentially what everybody prefers to use, right? And in that environment, they, they deal with, uh, you know, rat hard, you know, uh, platforms or triple mode redundancy platforms to afford more of this reliability again. Because, you know, at the end of the day, you're dealing with harsh radiation environments. You're looking at things that you can put into your system that inherently provides more resiliency against failure. But, but again, you know, still, even in that circumstance, you could deal with a component issue where there's just a latent issue with capacitors. So, one one other thing that I would uh, point out, uh, 
And if I think about my experience working with NASA, they spend a lot of time on flight rules and flight rule change requests. One of the big problems with software that I, I remember my, my coding days and don't want to go back, but uh, what is it that coders really don't like to do? Document. What is it that coders really need to do? Document. What do case tools need to do even better is document and version manage and self-updating archives of here's the config we're in now and here's how we got there and what is the human interpretable documentation and interpretation of our software state. And to the extent that that documentation is not available, it becomes increasingly difficult to even do state identification. So we've got to be able to identify it, we've got to be able to archive it, we've got to have human interpretable libraries of where we are right now. I apologize if you talked about this, but have you considered defenses against the Independence Day attack, that notion that they're going to insert, some alien is going to insert JavaScript in your platform? cause you problems, right? But so that's kind of opening. Is, are, do you guys have a sense of how you could restrict software engineering for space platforms such as a simple rule like no interpreted languages it has to be compiled? So it, I cannot imagine that NASA could actually say you can't do this <laughs> because it's so complicated. So many different groups, so many different software projects that have to come together to make a platform work. Do you have the ability to restrict languages, coding techniques, methodologies, and things like that? Or is that something that we all dream about? Good luck with onboard recovery if you do that. Oh, there's lots of issues to think about and consider, right? So, so but you guys are in a position where you have an overarching uh, mission that has some really great justifications for restrictions. Okay, it's hard to say that in many, um, say in F-35 type uh, platforms, you can say I'm only gonna have this language in this platform because I only have these processors and these architectures. But you guys have a very hybrid architecture in space, especially if you're gonna send something to Mars, you can end up with lots of different platforms, lots of different modules, lots of different languages, lots of different things. But could you guys, come up with a, a method to restrict the software engineering techniques that are being used, say from a security perspective, no interpreted languages. Is that feasible or is that just beyond the capability for the government to do? Is, 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 is that a reasonable question? You guys are all kind of looking at each other. I'm just wondering if I'm asking the right question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I think, um, I mean, for, for government, missions, you can mm -hmm. formulate a set of requirements, and that's what we have. And, mm -hmm. and the, for example, I mean, that's right. mentioned the, the yep. harsh um, kind of radiation requirement. That, that puts requirements on, mm -hmm. okay, well, what kind of hardware do you actually uh, fly? Can, can it survive that? In that sense, you also have software requirements. One of the strictest requirements is kind of computation power and speed. And many of the speed com uh, requirements lead you to the interpreted languages as, as they are just faster in that sense. So I don't think it's impossible to make a mission requirement there. Um, I don't think we can have control about the commercial missions. That's uh, difficult, yeah. exactly. Because yeah. I was going to say frequently we'll, ca we'll carry government payloads on commercial systems. And despite our box being secure and all efforts, I mean, if the you know uh, rocket blows up, you know, it, again, you're only as strong as your weakest link. So the issue is there's multiple players in the whole space business, right? Payload providers to the carrier, and uh, not everybody necessarily has the same requirements. Um, so there's kind of a black box. I mean, unless it's, a, again, it's a critical system that the uh, customer requires requirements across the board, that's likely. But, but again, I, I think getting everybody on board and Again, dealing, as we talked about, uh, cost-effective launches, those are challenges. Yeah, I've been, I mean, I think you probably know this too, actually, from talking earlier, that there's contracts, obviously, for different, different government contracts where they'll dictate the, the languages that you can and can't use, for sure. 
but doing it more from, I think you're saying more from a, a higher, higher policy type of uh, uh, approach in terms of everyone having to do that and maybe trying to, I guess in my mind, I'm trying to think what that would look like and maybe coming up with categories of different types of software and then limiting those different types of software possibly to certain particular languages, especially the kind of, lang the kind of functionalities that are required for security critical um, type of things and stuff like that. I, I, would, I would expect that that would be doable for sure in my mind. Um, but um, again, it would go back to those first two steps of understanding what is your strategy and so on and so forth. Um, and really defining what is it what is it you're saying you're accomplishing by that, right? Because um, if you don't say what it is you're trying to accomplish with it and so on and so forth, it's hard to tell what the... But, but it can be simple things like only IPv6 on the platform. So no IPv4 from the Internet could ever get onto the platform. You know, that, those kinds of restrictions actually are very protective and very architecturally restrictive, which gives you some control, right? Mm -hmm. No Windows software on the platform. No, Windows 98. You know, you can't get rid of that, right? Well, it's easier to, to restrict old. St I'm sorry. I'm code oh, no, it's easier to restrict old stuff off, but dictating new stuff that, is, what it, that ends up being old stuff is the problem. Well, a long time ago, it was thought that ATM was going to solve a lot of these problems because if ATM was the only thing running on these devices, nobody could get in, right? Because uh, no, there's no bridge. Mm -hmm. But uh, so these ideas of building real protective platforms that are incompatible with external infrastructure that can't use any of the same binaries, they're in the same interpret language types mm -hmm. work, you know? Well, but, but they're difficult, because it costs more money and all that kind of stuff. I'm just interested in your opinion. But, go, one of the big problems, though, is the testing and advanced development you need to develop will always put you in a launch state that is several years behind mm -hmm. what is going to be state of the art. And so you're always going to have a, a heterogeneous uh, architecture. And the launched architecture may be the oldest one there. So it's kind of hard to say, keep the rest of your platform in you know, the relative Stone Age. Yeah, and, and I think the, the timing issue is, is critical that, that we say, okay, my, my experience with government regulations on kind of technology is as it has to go through the legislative process, it's kind of when it comes into effect, it's kind of outdated at that point. So I would rather argue against it because I think it, in many cases the intention is good, but it's actually holding us back. Fortran is the answer. Okay. Yeah, that's <laughs> a, I was going to say something about Fortran. Nice. Minutes, so, uh, but please, sir. Sure. Um, quick uh, philosophical question. How are you going to manage the conflict? between the architectural perspective of engineers and programmers. Let me illustrate that. After a series of satellite failures, in 2002, the GAO published a report indicating two classes of threats to satellites. Class one were uh, unintentional acts, which included solar, wind, meteorites. And class two were intentional acts, like somebody trying to knock down a transmission tower. What they ignored were bad software architectural decisions, and poor coding practices, both of which have caused problems with satellites. Uh, System Socrates said two satellites were going to pass within 564 meters. Uh, the actual value was zero. Uh, the collision in 2009 created 2,000 pieces of debris. When you hear a number like 564, you would think there's a precision of plus or minus half a meter. They were off by 564. The uh, architectural decision I'm thinking of is that 10-bit weak counter, which rolled over on Saturday. And it turns out that some 777s actually had some problems with the date uh, as a result of that rollover. That's an architectural thing. These are neither intentional nor unintentional threats. And I'm thinking that the people who did the GA report came from an engineering mindset, not a programming mindset. And I believe that would seriously jeopardize any long-term space mission. I'd like your thoughts. Very brief thoughts from the panel. Hardware, software, vulnerability is vulnerability. Mm -hmm. no, I think that is a problem, but I think as universities, we try to say, OK, how can we make a more connected schedule to yeah, find a common language? I think that's yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. trusted supply chain, right? I mean, that's a given for any type of government furnished equipment. You always worry about that. And 
it's part of the reason why there are captive fabs because again with offshore suppliers you aren't certain about the pedigree so yeah i know within our industry there's definitely things in place to um obviously not, not just verification but software assurance and things like that a lot of uh things that were that that are worked to try to deal with those kind of things and it's kind of neat that now even though I'm a pretty young guy as far as I'm concerned um, you know they didn't have cybersecurity I tell my kids that I sound like an old guy but cybersecurity and all these things weren't a thing or they you know software assurance wasn't even a thing but you know all the universities have it now right um, and hopefully it, it only grows right so most of the people writing the code still didn't grow up with any of that stuff either so in my mind I'm hoping that you know through schools uh, through the colleges like Purdue and so on that this kind of pr the practices that lend themselves to avoiding those kind of things um, will be will, will improve I mean you have to admit it's pretty amazing that they got it exactly to zero though I mean that's pretty it's pretty impressive you couldn't do that twice <laughs> absolutely